Welcome ladies and gentlemen, drop a like before we get started to show your support. Subscribe if you are new here. I am your host, let's begin. I bought an Apple Watch when they were new to the market. I didn't find myself using it to its fullest potential, so I figured I would just sell it on Craigslist. I took photos of the front, back and each of the bands and posted my ad. I got several responses right away, almost instantly, but I decided to answer them in order. First come, first serve seemed the fair way to go about this. I got a reply from a man who was in the military. He was buying the watch for his cousin as a graduation gift. I thought that was kind and it had meaning behind it, so I chose him. Since the party for the graduation was that weekend, he asked if I could send the watch next day and he'd sent extra money to compensate the added expense. I agreed, and I figured it was a good idea. I got a PayPal receipt and headed to the post office. Well, after I'd posted the package and sent him the tracking number, you know, to make sure the gift would arrive on time, it struck me as odd that I didn't get an email from my bank notifying me of the pending transfer of funds. I pulled up the PayPal receipt again and noticed little things that were just slightly off. Normally, when I sold things on Craigslist, I would click the address of the sender to verify that it's real once I'd sent the payment on PayPal. In this case, I didn't do it. I was in such a rush and so bewildered and I genuinely fell for the fact that this guy was holding it for a graduation party and that he needed it the next day. When I did it in this instance, it was something long and unintelligible rather than a legitimate PayPal address. When I checked it this time, the address made no sense. There were also other clues indicating it wasn't a valid PayPal receipt. I felt like such an idiot. I warn people against this sort of thing all the time, and here I was, in such a rush to help this person that I had fallen right for it. I went down to my local police station to tell them what happened. I found out that since I lived in an unincorporated neighborhood, I'd need to speak to the sheriff's office. That sounded even more intimidating and official. The sheriff's office was wonderful and actually sent someone to meet me at my local police station and we spoke about what happened. I explained the ad, the response, the man in the military, the cousin, the graduation gift and the next day mail. The deputy tasked with helping me said there was nothing that they could really do without the serial number, but he'd write a report for me. I said wait, and I told him that I had taken photos of everything. You see, I may have been an idiot and fell for this scam, but I realized that I had a picture of the back of the watch and I also had a photo of this serial number. So. I may have been an idiot, but I was a smart idiot. The sheriff's deputy took down the number and wrote down the address where I had sent the watch. He was going to contact that local police department and see if it led to anything. I thanked him for helping me and sheepishly left to tell my boyfriend, friends and parents what had just happened. Two days later, my new deputy friend called to tell me the police department in the town where I sent the watch had actually gotten a warrant for the house where I sent it to. They searched the house and found not only one watch, but thousands of them. To be precise, these people had thousands of dollars worth of watches, tens of thousands and expensive electronics. There was a woman who lived there and she allowed the items to be sent to her home for her fiancé who lived in Nigeria. She claimed they were gifts and he is a noble and honest man who does nothing wrong. The police tried to tell her he's lying, he's thieving and he was a guy that wouldn't have really explained the truth to her clearly. Imagine a real Nigerian prince internet scammer. At any rate, the deputy said that because of my filing of a report, in the suburbs of Chicago, people all across the country were going to get valuable items back. When they raided the house, they found loads of other people's items that they also bought on Craigslist. This was a very clever scam that had been developed and a method that was used by the Nigerians to scam people out of their devices and then never pay for them. 
He said I was the only person he'd ever known who actually got an item back in a situation such as this. The deputy also told me the police department would be sending my watch back within the next week. A few days later I got a call that my watch was in. I had to go to this scary jail building to pick it up. I had to go through the scanner, get checked for weapons, and talk on this phone thing to state why I was there. A woman walked me back to this property locker room type space and gave me an envelope containing the package I'd shipped the watch and bands in. It was still wrapped in the tissue I'd packed them in. Now I wear my watch every day and stay away from Craigslist. My friend is a piano tutor. She has many students and there was a time when she advertised on Craigslist to teach people so she would advertise lessons for a set rate. I can't remember what the set rate was but anyone could join in with the lessons whether they wanted private one-to-one -one or group lessons. She would teach people all the way up to high levels and even taking their grades in musical theory and practical. She's a fantastic player and still to this day she plays almost every single day. Whenever I go round to her, she is always on the piano. She has three keyboards and one grand piano. I think the grand piano is something crazy, like $40,000. Yeah, for a piano, that is crazy. So, the story begins that she put her ad up on Craigslist. She was advertising to teach students piano lessons for a fee. At the time, it was her full-time career, and it was what she did to earn a living. After a week or so, she got a few responses back. Two were ladies and one was a man. She decided to take the man first and then reschedule the ladies for later during the week. This was at the start of the week on a Tuesday. The guy was due to come around at the evening time, so I think around 4 or 5 p.m., just after he claimed he gets off work. Now my friend told me that as he walked up to her house, he looked super weird. He was hard to explain because when I asked her, she couldn't really make out much about him. The only thing she kept going on about over and over was the vibes that he gave off. The vibes were almost so bad that she felt sick and uneasy even letting this guy into her house for the lessons. But she figured the guy was there, he had the cash and he was paying her before the lesson. So, once she took the cash in her hands, she realised there wasn't much she could do. Although she could refuse him out right there and then at the door, she figured she would just not have the confidence to do that and she would need an excuse to do that at the same time. So, ignoring her gut instinct, she decided to let this guy in the house. They proceed with the piano lesson, which at the time lasted 40 minutes. He sat down at the grand piano and believe it or not, she started the lesson, yes, on the $40,000 grand piano, which I always advertised and encouraged her not to do that. I thought her students should start on the keyboards, but I guess she thought otherwise. So, she sat down with this guy. Apparently the whole time he was staring at her really creepily and just acting super uneasy. She managed to try and not pay attention to her gut feeling, which again, I said was a bad idea, but, to be professional, I guess it wasn't such. She got her music books out, her theory, her chords, etc. Whatever pianists do, I don't know. But she teaches the lesson, and by the time it's over, the guy is still acting real weird. She said he wasn't really a great learner, and had issues trying to play even the simplest of scales. Apparently his fingers were awful, big and clumpy for playing the piano, and he was often missing some of the keys completely, or pressing two at once. Obviously she was there to teach him, so she tried her best. At the end of the lesson, she offered to reschedule the lesson. So, basically weekly lessons to improve his piano skills. Anyone with an ounce of a brain cell will know that top musicians have been training their whole lives. Practice makes perfect is the legitimate truth within that community. So, my friend recommended once a week. The guy looks at her, all confused, and says, no, I'm fine, thanks for the lesson though. As he's about to leave, he stops. Just stood at the door, he starts staring my friend up and down, like literally from head to toe, almost as if he's contemplating in his mind doing something real bad. My friend got really confused and asked the guy, can I help you, is everything okay? 
She even went as far as to ask, do you need to use the toilet? The guy stared at her blankly for another three seconds, and then just, as if he clicked back into reality, said, No, uh, I'm fine thanks, thanks for the lesson, and then proceeds to walk out the door, and leave. She couldn't tell whether this guy brought his car, because the way my friend's property is situated, she has long, thick hedges either side. All she remembers, the last she saw of this guy, was he turned the corner to the left of her property and walked down the sidewalk. So she just assumed that he had walked there. After this lesson, she shut the door and told me that she really had the creeps. She felt super weird even for the rest of that evening. Well, long story short, fast forward many weeks. It turns out, the guy that she taught piano to during that 40 minute lesson was Philip Markov. This was the man branded as the Craigslist killer. He was convicted of murdering women that he met through Craigslist, and we couldn't believe what on earth had just happened. Somehow, he had decided to not take action on my friend. The moment where he stood in the doorway and looked her up and down must have been that split second where he was making the decision whether he wanted to kill her or let her live. We still wonder to this day as I talk to my friend, what would it have been that made him decide that you live, but the others don't? She was home alone, he could have easily gotten away with it, and by the time he was about to leave, it was getting dark as it was the winter, so around 6pm. At this point, it really traumatised her for the rest of her life, even up until today. For a while, she even stopped taking new clients on for her piano lessons, and only stuck with her regulars. This was something that I talk about with her almost every time I see her, and the case of Philip Markov is chilling to say the least, but to say you've met the guy face to face, and taught him piano, is a whole nother type of chilling. In 2010, I moved to LA. I needed to find my own place once my summer agreement ran up. I was looking for a dirt cheap apartment that was preferably near my school. I saw a Craigslist ad pop up and it kept coming up in my search. Three vegan college students seeking roommate. Now, I'm not vegan, but I knew I could be respectful and get along with just about anyone. There were even photos of the girls in the listing. They looked pretty nice. I called the number and a man answered. He asked me to come by and see the place. He told me my would-be roommates also studied at the nearby community college that I also was attending, even going so far as to tell me their majors. It all sounded pretty legit, but I brought a friend along just in case. When we got to the house, he showed me the smallest room I was interested in. The price was incredible, and I at the time was a broke student. Then, he went on to show me the other rooms, and they were completely empty. Nobody was living in them. He told me, oh yeah, they're only for the other two roommates. They're not here right now, the both of them are still moving in. I just didn't buy it. But I hoped they were actually people who had simply flaked on him and he hadn't yet realised. And, I knew I couldn't find a room at this price anywhere else. So, I took the room, moved in with a sleeping bag and kept my guard up, hoping for the best. Oh boy, I was a dumb kid. I soon realised that this man was my only roommate. He slept in the bedroom on the other side of mine. I knew something was really not right. Obviously, but I had no other options in sight and I figured I could just stay on campus for as long as possible every day to avoid having to keep, well, company with this guy. I had just taken a coffee shop job that paid next to nothing and I knew that I couldn't afford to move anywhere else at that time. It was about a week or so into the rental agreement when this man asked me to come into the living room to have a chat with him he wanted to chat with me so we could quote unquote get to know each other better. He tried to start a casual conversation, which quickly developed into him mentioning various things that he's seen on adult movies. Yeah, if you get me. 
He was saying that how he doesn't understand why some people like that stuff. He was very adamant about how gross he thought it all was. He also went on to say that if I was late on paying rent but we were good friends, that we would have a good relationship even if I was late paying rent. Now, I kind of knew where this was going and it got seriously, seriously dodgy quick. There I was, sat down in his living room with him smirking, grinning and looking like the most predator type guy I had ever sat in front of. He was giggling, chuckling to himself while describing the fact that I could do favours for him if I was late paying my rent. I'd never been so freaked out before in my whole life and everything really hit rock bottom when it got serious. He said to me, let's say you and I have a really good friendship, like a really good one. Well, then maybe you wouldn't even have to pay any rent at all. While saying that, he was grinning the whole time, looking me up and down like an absolute creep. And with that, I stood up and said, okay, I definitely can't live here anymore. I'm going to move out now. Thank you. I grabbed what I could carry and called a friend to pick me up immediately. The guy was livid following me around the apartment as I tried to collect my items. He then just switched big time. He started demanding a month's rent that he said I owed him, which I didn't. My parents have always taught me not to mess with crazy, so I found the money but paid him anyway. For the next three months I slept on my friend's floor only when his roommate wasn't home since he was sensitive about freeloaders, which I thought was fair enough. I also slept on the couch at work when I was absolutely sure no one would know, or even the restroom at a nearby 24 hour grocery store where no one ever bothered me. Things were tough, but I was willing to do all that rather than live with this creep who quite clearly was just weird. Three months later, I finally found a room I could afford with a female musician. But the situation still makes me shudder. This kind of agreement is not unheard of in the places like LA. But I hope all the time that he didn't prey on any other unwilling parties under similar false pretenses. I still don't know how I could have warned others, but I wish I had and I felt like I should have. I was looking for a roommate once and saw an ad from a single mother. I can't remember what her ad said but for some reason I remember feeling bad for her. So I responded. She called me and told me her story. That threw some bureaucratic something that wasn't her fault. She was being evicted from her apartment and needed some place to go immediately. It sounded legit to me so I agreed to let them move in with me. She paid the first month's rent and they moved in with what little things they had. Neither of them had a bed and they both slept on my couch. She didn't have a car either and there was some big dramatic story about something that wasn't her fault that caused her to lose her license plate. I see a pattern developing and after a while I get a bit suspicious as to what is going on in this woman's life. Soon after though, like a week after she moved in, she stopped doing any housework. Dishes would pile up in the sink. The two of them would eat my food. She always promised to buy food but of course there was some reason she couldn't. Next month she asked if she could be a little late with the rent. Some reason why she was unable to have it when it was due of course. She eventually paid it but getting it out of her was like pulling teeth and I came to the conclusion that she just didn't want to pay it and was looking for a free ride. Then I came home one day and my car was gone. I had a company vehicle and I don't have to drive my personal car to work so it sits all day. And sure enough, on this day it was gone from my garage when I came home. It turns out her 12 year old kid had taken it joyriding to try and impress his friends and didn't even bother bringing it back until around 7pm that evening. So, by this point I had had enough and told her to get out. I think she had assumed that she was going to stay with me forever 
because she literally had not put one minute of thought into another living situation and was crying and begging me to let her stay. In the end though, she called her pastor and I dropped them and their garbage bags full of belongings off at her church. On the way there though, she asked if she could ask me a question. I said yes. She said, are you throwing us out because of the car thing? I said yes, that was the nail in the coffin. And they looked at me a bit confused. I had no idea how they just expected to use me, but on top of that, drive my car illegally. Even if they had asked, it still would have been crazy, but they didn't even do that. When I moved to Los Angeles, California a few years ago, I needed to buy a vacuum. I saw one on Craigslist for super cheap, so I called the number. A woman answered and gave me the cross streets and told me to call when I was there. When I arrived, I called. A man then answered the phone, and when I asked to speak to Jennifer, he said she wasn't there. Then things started getting a bit weird. The man said he would open up the gate and I could drive up the back. So I guess at the time I was a bit triggered by this, but I figured, well, I was just there for the vacuum, nothing else. What were the chances of these people actually being crazy? I was in the neighborhood in LA next to a really big blue building. There was a gated area with security guards and sure enough, the gates started opening and I decided to drive in. I had no idea where I was, it was so confusing. It was some kind of a community that I couldn't quite make out. I parked and got out of my car. The man who was on the phone greeted me and came outside. I asked him where the vacuum was and he told me to follow him. I was a bit nervous at this point because I didn't know where I was. I was leaving my car parked out back and at this point the gates had now shut. They were those old automatic type gates where, well, you could climb them but my car was now trapped in if anything went wrong. The man proceeds to open up a door with steps going down into a huge warehouse slash dungeon like room. It had tons of furnaces, cobwebs and old machinery piled up. There was so much stuff, kids bikes, vacuums, hula hoops, old TVs and even desks all in the corners of this room or dungeon. You name it, they had it. It looked like some sort of underworld garage sale. At this point, I'm confused and slightly terrified at the same time that I'll never escape this place. But I see my vacuum, I grab it and ask if they take cash, trying to get the hell out of there as fast as I could. The guy turns to me and says that they don't. So I have to go upstairs to pay a different person using my card. Keep in mind I still have no idea where I am, so when I meet another woman in a similar work uniform to the last guy and she starts taking my payment information, that's when I decide to ask her, what is this, where are we? They were wearing weird uniforms as if they were all part of some cult. She replies when I ask where are we, saying, you're in the church of Scientology. I ended up making it out and the vacuum turns out to be great. That being said, always go with a buddy when you buy stuff on Craigslist, because you never know, you might end up in a church of Scientology in their underground hoarding dungeon. Once, when I was a few years younger than I am now, I was selling a lot of items my daughter brought home from college that she no longer needed. One item was a microwave in good condition. I already had one so I decided to sell this one online. I've often used Craigslist without any problems so of course I'm not thinking of any dangers that could arise. Well, I soon put myself in a pretty dangerous position. A man, he sounded young, called inquiring about the microwave. I seriously wanted someone to come and pick it up but he said that he was taking care of his sick father and couldn't leave him but really needed a microwave. He told me where he lived, which really wasn't very far away from me. 
an apartment building that was in the side of a town that was relatively safe, so I agreed to take it to him. Once I arrived to the building, he asked if I could bring it up the steps. I said no because it was just too heavy. He said he could not leave the apartment. I was going to have to bring it up, he said. Well, at this point, I just wanted my money and to leave, so I agreed to that. There I went holding it up a flight of stairs. Luckily, it wasn't one of those very large ones, but still, it was an inconvenience to me and I broke a sweat, to say the least. Once I got to his apartment door, I saw him, a man in his mid to late thirties, standing there with shorts, a muscle shirt on, and behind him were lots of barbells and weights for bodybuilding. He was in magnificent shape, with an absolute huge build. He said to me, oh please set it down here, motioning to the kitchen counter. Okay, that required that I enter the room, which immediately I felt uncomfortable. He then proceeded to inform me that actually he couldn't come for the microwave because he was on house arrest after serving 15 years in prison. I had parked beyond his permitted parameters and he couldn't make it out to my car. All I felt was every ounce of blood run out of my body at this moment, or so it seemed that way. He was alone, there was no one there and he was caring for, an invisible father that didn't exist. He just lied to me about that to get me up here and now I'm alone in an apartment with a felon right out of prison who could snap my neck like a twig if he should even think about it. I remember that I mumbled something along the lines of, okay, here you go, delivered. Slowly inching my way towards the door. He said hold on, let me get your money, and went to the other room just quick enough to retrieve the money. I almost ran out, but I had a strange feeling that I shouldn't do that. I just needed to remain calm and act like all is okay and then leave ASAP once he put the cash in my hands. Eventually, he handed me the money and then started to chit chat a bit. I listened for a second and got to the door somehow. When I turned to leave, he quickly said to me, oh, it won't turn on. How does it work? Can you show me? So I had to turn around and go back in. Terrified, but trying not to look terrified. Somehow I kept my cool and I said, oh, you just press this, this and that, and I just basically showed him. To my great relief, the microwave came on, and he chuckled saying that he was not good with appliances. Okay, so he was being nice, but something just felt off. I made it back to the door, and almost ran to the stairs, but forced myself to walk slow, as to not alarm him. I felt like if I did, it would make him mad. All of a sudden, I heard an uncomfortable laugh behind me. I didn't turn around to engage, I just kept walking down those stairs till I was at the bottom and could breathe again. I soon saw other people and felt better. What on earth was I thinking? I couldn't believe I had placed myself in that position. Sure, he didn't do anything physical to me, but he did lie to get me there. What else was he capable of doing? When I think of all the possible scenarios that could have gone down, had I have not been cool headed, I think he may have attacked me and who knows what else. Not a soul would have known. I hadn't told anyone from home where I was going. Yes, I'd be missing and probably for days or even months before I was found. To this day, I still get scared feeling in my guts, just thinking about what could have happened to me if I'd been taken by surprise while alone with this man. Never never again.